Okay. All right. Does anyone remember what we started last week, this series? Does it? Anyone? 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 Okay, no. So last week we started this series, something that Mark um, touched on a couple weeks ago, and we were going to pick up, we were going to roll with it a little bit, and it was talking about abide in me. And last week I touched on the fact that when Christ was walking the earth, that's not something that he necessarily said initially. When he started, his, uh, his call to his disciples was always either follow me or come to me. And that was a reoccurring thing that he was saying throughout his ministry. But towards the end of his life, before the crucifixion and his ascension, it progressed. And the message changed from like a come to me or a follow me. And, and, um, and today I want, and it changed into abide in me. But today I want to touch on this statement that, and we're going to see it in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. So if you have your Bible, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. And I think it's something that we've all heard this before, and we're going to dig into it a little bit because while I was reading it and kind of preparing for today, I realized that this was a very, very loaded statement. <clears throat> and, and the verse is, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And I started thinking about that, right? That's such a simple thing. You know, what he's basically, it's such a simple thing, but by far it's probably one of those, his most beautiful promises. Because the one thing that he is offering here that is very appealing is the idea of rest. And although it seems simple, it doesn't take long for you once you start, like, you know, you, you end up growing up and we're actually called to, to be adults and we're adulting to realizing that this idea of rest is anything but simple. It's actually really, really huge. And it's something that if we were honest with ourselves, I think it's something that every single one of us looks for. We desire, we pursue. Um, and, and rest for the soul, a lot of, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be wanting stuff right? It also doesn't mean that it's all of our fear is going to disappear. It doesn't mean that he's going to fulfill all of our desires because I think a lot of the times that what we, that's what we tie rest to. Like we will have rest when everything else is done. I've achieved everything. I have everything. I'm blessed. I'm happy. I'm everything else. But um, have you ever noticed in the original invitation when Christ extends it to us to come, he actually repeats this promise to rest two different times. See, because the first invitation says, come to me and I will, I will give you rest. And I love this because it means that our amount of rest is directly tied to, to the nearness of the Savior, right? It, it's directly tied to how close we are because he says, come to me. And, we, and I promise you that we won't, we won't have it anywhere else. It has to be next to him. The second invitation is in that same passage he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then, so, and then he also promises rest, but I want to lean into just that portion real quick, right? Because what is Christ saying? Christ is saying, learn from me. Learn from me. And what that really means is that it's like commit to my school of thought. Like learn my ways because, and the thing that I was thinking about while I was preparing this yesterday was every single one of us has graduated from a school of thought. Like we all have these thoughts and these ideas of what we think things should look like, like where I will find happiness, where I'll find joy, where I'll find satisfaction. And ultimately we even have our own school of thought on where I'll find rest. But when we talk about learning from Christ that's, that's a different type of training. It's a training that's, that we have to submit all things to him. Bring them all to, not only to him, but to bring them subject to his will. To let your whole life be one with him. You know, that's crazy. When you start thinking about that's what he's really calling us to. And I wonder when he says, bring it all to me, let your whole life be with me. Let every aspect of your life be with, you, with me, right? Do things my way. That is really just a translation of abide in me. 
Like, let us be one in everything that we're doing. And when he says, learn from me, well, what else does he say in that passage? He tells us, he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. And I want to, to think about that. He wants us to be gentle. Gentle, because he, he told us to learn from him, and that's what he is. Gentle and lowly in heart. So if I told you that, that this rest is found in being gentle and it's found in being lowly of heart, you know, maybe some of us are running around in our lives, but that's not how we're living. We're not lonely. We're not gentle of heart, right? But I, but I ask you guys to, to look at some of the people that you know that have the most peace in their life. Some of the most restful people that you know in your life how are they running it? Like when we think of these, these peaceful people, are they gentle people? Are they lonely in heart people? Are they doing it his way? And to be honest with you, I think if we were honest, at least when I apply that principle in my life and I look at these people, then I say, I wish I had the rest that they had. They're very, they've, they've learned a lot from Christ and they're very gentle and they're very lowly of heart. And the idea of rest is a very, very desirable thing. I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't love this idea of rest. To be honest, even in my own life, if there's one thing I desire, um, you know, I would love to have more rest. And I think that's typical, not just in, in my life, in my household. I think a lot of us now, we all realize that there's not a lot of rest going on. And we're running hard and we're doing a million different things. And this idea of rest is beautiful, but the, it's a greater idea than we believe that God, God only gives us rest when we are in sync with him. So the best way to know how synced or how much we are abiding in him is check your rest, right? Because when we have no rest, chances are we might not be abiding in him. And I think along the way, we forget how to abide in him completely, because to abide in him completely, that branch has nothing outside of the vine. It's, you know, it's to really give up yourself and to give everything wholly to him. And what does that mean? It means that we allow him to rule and we allow him to guide. And also in this passage in, 11, uh, in Matthew 11, what does he tell us? He says, my yoke my yoke, take my yoke upon you. Well, what does that mean to take up his yoke? Does anyone know what a yoke is like in the Old Testament? It was something that they used when they were like plowing the farm or when they were carrying a load and you'd put like this, it was like a wooden bar or um, some type of collar that they would put on the work animals, right? And they were joined at the head to pull that load together. So you can imagine, you know, there's another verse that talks about being yoked in the Bible. And it says when it talks about when it's dating, it says, you know, do not marry an unbeliever because you do not want to be unequally yoked. So it talks about you being attached to something and being on that same path. So if you are, if you take Christ's yoke upon you, who gets to lead? I think we can all agree it's going to be him, right? Because there's only one story that I can think of, some, of someone who wrestled with God all night and did it go his way? It didn't. And he limped for the rest of his life, right? So it's, it's giving him the complete submission to not only tell us where to go, right? But we are tied with him and we, and we will not go without him, right? So we are being led by him, taught by him and shown how to abide in him to do what he wants and to be what he wants us to be because those are the conditions of his discipleship. And to be honest with you, this whole idea of being yoked with him, that's just step one. If we don't even sign up to the yoke, to be joined with him, to buy into his direction, to buy into his discipleship, then we won't get anywhere because that's just a very, very first step, which is submission to him. And to be honest, if, we were, if you had to look at yourself and take a little bit of self-assessment, that could be the reason <coughs> why rest escapes us so quickly. 
right? Because Christ promised it, but it seems like it escapes us so quickly. And, and maybe we didn't realize that. Maybe we didn't realize that this whole idea of the yoke was just the first step. No one told us that Christ wanted complete submission, No one told us that he requires undivided access to our whole entire heart, to our whole entire life. Because there is not one aspect of your life, not a single aspect, that God does not want to reign over. There's not a single corner where he's going to say, you can have that. He wants his light to shine, and he wants it to shine so bright that it lights up everything, leaving absolutely no darkness. So it's not just about pleasing him. It's not just about showing up on a Sunday. It's not just about putting a check in the box. It's not about any of that stuff, right? Because he wants it all. And my question for us is, will we allow him to go everywhere? Will we follow him anywhere? Because some of us don't realize that that's exactly what Christ is asking of us. Some of us might not even think it's possible for us to even step into that. The task looks too big and too daunting. But to take up Christ's yoke and to always be connected to him, to always let him lead, you know, it does sound like a lot. And it sounds like it's going to take a lot of effort. And maybe we we might think that I'm not good enough for that. Like it is outside my ability. Like I am too weak. And there's no way it's going to happen. See, because a lot of the times we look at this idea of abiding in Christ is that's, that's too high. It's too big. That's something for the saints. Like that, that's not me, right? And we think, we, we, we tell ourselves that that might be something that we might be able to achieve after a long life of holiness, maybe after a long life of growth but like not where I'm at right now. But there's a problem with that, right? Because we all know that every single word in this Bible is true. And it contradicts the Bible because in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, Christ is telling us my yoke is easy. He doesn't say it's difficult. He doesn't say it's too hard. He says my yoke is easy. So if he's telling us his yoke is easy, then it has to be easy. If he's telling us it is going to give rest, then we have to have rest. And here's the, here's the catch, right? The moment our soul yields, right before that's the challenge, right? Before the submission. But the moment our, our, our soul yields itself to submit, that is when the Lord gives us the strength to do it. And many of us, we haven't stepped into that to receive that strength because it's too, it looks too hard. Notice something in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, where again, where he says, take my, lo- my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's going to teach us. Like, don't ever think that when we're stepping into this, that we are on our own and he's just going to leave us. It would never happen that way, right? Because again, and I love this part where he says that I am gentle, I'm lowly of heart. He speaks about two things, right? The first thing he speaks about is his character. He will be gentle and meek with us. Because we know that there's a, you know, it's going to be a process. We're not going to get it right the first time, right? But he's saying that I'm going to be gentle and I'm meek with you while you're in my school. I'm not a strict disciplinary. I'm not the teacher that when you get something wrong, I'm going to reprimand you. You know, I will be, I will be gentle of heart with you as well, right? I will be patient with you until we get it all right. And that's the character that will meet every one of our needs, along the way, the same way that a mother would care for her child is the same way that Christ wants to disciple us. The other way that it's intended is to tell us to take up his yoke and to learn from him, and he wants us to imitate him. He wants us to be gentle. He wants us to be meek. And I love this, right? Because he wants us to learn from him. And if you're not gentle, what are you? I thought of a bunch of words, right? If you're not gentle, you're rough, you're tough, you're abrasive, you're like all of these things. And I started to think about that, right? All of those other words that are the opposite of gentle, those tend to be non-restful emotions. So a lot of the times it's, it's the fact that we're not gentle. That is what's costing us our rest, 
right? But if you're, if you're not lowly in heart, I'm sorry, I jumped, right? But if you're not gentle, then you'll never have rest. And, we, and he wants us to learn that from him, right? And if you're not lonely in heart, what does that mean, right? If you're not lowly in heart, that means you're a proud man. You're a proud man. And if you're a proud man, what does that mean? Easily offended. You want things your own way. You always, you're always demanding more. Do those sound like restful emotions? Not at all. So a lot of the times, the fact that our lives we don't have rest could be tied to the fact that we, we're not, we don't possess those characteristics that Christ is calling us to. Because it's really, really hard to steal the peace from someone who's truly humble. Remember we talked about those people earlier? The people that walk around and it seems that they have so much rest? I guarantee you, those are, it's tied to very, very humble people, right? They know that they're a small piece in a very, very big puzzle. And they know that who's in control of the puzzle? The author and the finisher of our faith, Christ. And because of that, they don't have to fight. They don't have to argue because their faith realizes that God's in control of everything and they don't need to have it their way or the way that they see it. So when we take his yoke, we have to learn to be more like him and we have to allow him to lead us, even if it's places that we don't want to go. When we do this, we can start receiving everything that Christ has for us. Because we want to be united with him. We want to follow him. We want to surrender to him completely. We want to obey him. We want to trust him. And ultimately, if we are honest with ourselves, we want to receive from him. So here lies the problem. When we dig into our own teachings and we really understand what he is saying, we realize that it isn't about what happened at the beginning, right? Because at the beginning, if we were all honest, like we all showed up to church today. So I would like to say that in the beginning, we all started with joy, strength, and somewhere along the way, we might have lost our rest. And after reading this passage, I was actually kind of convicted because on Friday, some of us went to go see The Chosen, which is they're showing some of the episodes in the movie theater now. And we're watching episode seven and episode eight. And there's this powerful scene where, um, where Christ is talking to them. And at this point, we're like right before Holy Week. So the, the, you know, the opposition's coming, the disciples are confused, Christ is trying to talk to them, letting them know kind of like the grand scheme of things. He's hinting upon his death and, and they're completely, and he's speaking rather plain to them, but they are completely and utterly missing it. Um, and to be honest with you, that's how I kind of felt getting back into this passage here, right? Because here it's perfectly clear what he's calling us to, right? He's telling us that this is exactly what I want you to do right? This is exactly what's called. But when we read it, you know, it's not what I thought, right? I've heard this passage a million times before, right? And I was just reading it, I guess, under a different lens. But when reading it this, you know, to, or this weekend, I realized that he wants a lot more from us, right? His goal in our life is not just to make us happy. His goal in our life is not just to pour out blessings. It's not so we can just get married, have 2.3 kids, have a white picket fence. Like, you know, that's not his goal for us, right? And I think a lot of the times we show up and we come to church to get our punch card punched to say like, see, God, I did what I'm supposed to do. This is, I did my part. Now, can you rain out your blessings? And I think that that's very, very, it was very convicting for me, right? Because God wants so much more than just that. And the reason that we might not be experiencing the joy and the rest that he's speaking about, the joy and the rest that we see throughout all of these gospels and throughout all of the pages of this Bible is because we might not be in alignment with exactly what he's calling us to. That could be the first thing. Maybe we're not experiencing it because we're not in alignment with what he's calling us to. And we're not deep enough. We're not committed enough. And we keep back a bunch of stuff that we're not willing to give up to him. But then I also started thinking about it and some of us might not be experiencing it because we are led into sin and there's sin that, that is in our life and we might not even know it. You know, we decided that we would follow Christ, but we never knew the depth of what he was calling us, how he was calling us to live. We didn't understand that we were going to take that yoke, that we were going to learn from him and that we were going to start living a different life. And I'm going to tell you, you guys all know the verse Romans 8, 28. 
probably one of the most quoted verses in the world, right? Where I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, and we know all things work together for the good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. And I think everybody loves that verse because it's very, very generic. And it's a, ve- it's a verse of blessing. It basically says, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. But I have this little pet peeve, right? Where someone will cherry pick a verse, especially when there's, there's the completion of it right after. So that's Romans 8, 28. And then we also have Romans 8, 29. It says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the important part, guys. It's not, hey, everything's just going to work out. All things are going to come to good, right? The important part of that passage is what is the good? The good is to be conformed to the image of his son. And I think if we don't understand that, if we don't understand what the whole purpose of this is, then we're going, to get, we're going to fall right back into our sin because we are looking for something that God never promised, right? We're looking for an easy life, a life full of blessings, a life where I show up on Sunday and he takes care of my Monday through Friday, the life that I'm going to get a promotion at work because I'm a good person, the why, you know, all, all of this stuff, but that's not the stuff that's promised here. <clears throat> and I believe that it's because we never understood that right? We never understood what Christ is calling us to sign up for, that we will never receive the power to overcome it. And we need to stay near to him because if we're honest with ourselves, we keep wandering off, right? He said, come to me, come to me and I'll give you rest. We have to be near, right? Do you guys miss that love that you first felt when you first came into, into connection with him? When you first came into relationship? our first love, and how many of us have lost that? We might have started on that path, right? We were supposed to stay close to him, but it ended up not looking the way that we thought it was going to look. So we started to kind of wander off a little bit because the path that Christ has for us is from glory to glory, right? That's what Christ wanted for us, just to draw us in deeper, to keep him close so that we would always be abiding in him every step of the way. But I think if we were honest with ourselves, we remember that first love. We remember that path. But then we might have veered off a little bit. We might have wandered off. And now our walk looks a lot more like the nation of Israel, right? Wandering through the desert. The thing that kills me about the nation of Israel, you know, wandering through the desert is they were always moving. They were never going very far. Were they seeing God work? They were. Water from a rock, you know, they had the pillar, they had the cloud, they had the tabernacle. They, they were seeing God's work. But each and every one of them fell short from the promised land, well, with the exception of two. And my fear is that we, we would end up like them too, right? Because while they were wandering in that desert, they were wandering, they were weary, they were wanting, they were thirsty, and they never had rest for 40 years. So let me ask you guys something. Do you guys think that it is easy to bear his yoke? Because I think a lot of the times we think like, I, Pete, I know the Bible says it's easy. You know, I know that it says that his burden is light, but honest, I, no, I don't think it's easy. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of the times it feels, you know, the, the hardest part isn't that we're bearing his yoke, you know, It's the fact that it's what's keeping us from bearing his yoke is hard because we won't give up that other stuff. That's the challenging part, not the yoke. It's what's preventing us from taking on the yoke. That's the challenge, right? Because if we were like, we love sin, we love the world. And if we were honest with ourselves, it seems as if sin in the world is providing the rest that we need, but it's not. That's hundred percent not true because where was, where will the, the traveler ever find rest? outside of his own bed, right? Where does a, child, a tired child find the greatest comfort? His mother's arms. And I will tell you that our souls will never ever find rest outside of the one who created us. It's our own disbelief that keeps, looking us, keeps us looking outside, right? For the one, it's our greatest, sorry, it's our own disbelief that keeps us looking outside for rest when there's only one person that can give it to us. 
It's the same rest that he promised. And without him, there would be absolutely no rest. So when he says, abide in me and learn from me, he really meant it. And I believe that if we did abide in him and we did learn from him, then the only, the only other option would be to throw ourselves in his arms. So if we abide in him and we learn from him, we'd realize that there's nothing else that's going to satisfy us outside of him. Do you know what we're going to find in those arms? We're going to find love. We're going to find blessings. We're going to find acceptance, encouragement. And honestly, with all my, with all my heart, we, we find rest there. It's not the yoke that's difficult. It's the resistance of us picking up the yoke that causes the difficulty. Because we know that that yoke means complete and undivided surrender. It means wholeheartedly obedience. And I love it because he says, take my yoke, learn from me, abide in me. And I love that because those are all commands. They're not requests. They're not suggestions. And commands are meant to be obeyed. The obedient student doesn't argue or question the professor. The obedient student knows the place of the professor, knows and accepts the teachings in confidence that the teacher knows what's best and the teacher will provide everything needed for the lesson. Our ability to abide in his rest and his blessings 100%, right? We have to have a faith in God that he will meet us where we're at and that he, not only that he is willing, but that he will provide because he promised it. So abiding in Christ is nothing but giving up oneself to be taught and led so that we can rest in the arms of the Savior himself because his arms were the only ones that were ever meant to give us rest. So we pray, God, give me a heart that desires that. All of these areas that I've chased for false rest that have never provided, let me turn my back on those. Let me stop going back to the things that I one time believed would give me rest that proved to fail. If my heart doubts or fears that this is too high for me, that I can't do it, that it's too, too much work and I'll never be able to attain it, then, then I ask that let us hear your words. Let us hear Christ tell every single one of us personally, not just in the words of the Bible, right? Not just when we're reading. I ask that way. every single one of us hears the words of Christ personally. Abide in me, take my yoke, learn from me, for you should find um, rest for your souls. Because I promise you, when Christ himself whispers those words to you, that, exact, that is exactly what we need to hear for us to do it. Amen? All right, stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because we know that your desire is to make us whole. Your desire is to give us rest. Your desire is to keep us near you. But Lord, we get so distracted with the things that are all around us. We get so distracted by temporary pleasures or the things that we think will satisfy, but they never satisfy, Lord. They always just make us want more. They make us more thirsty. They make us more tired, Lord, and just our tireless pursuit of, uh, of trying to find them. But Lord, I ask that you just make your yoke appealing to us, Lord. The only way that's going to happen, Lord, is if we, if we hear you, call every single one of us individually to call us into you, Lord, to go into, to completely submit your direction, your way, obedience, Lord. So I ask that this week, Lord, that, that we take up that yoke, and that you show us what it's like to be in perfect union with you, Lord, in complete submission, to allow you, Lord, to point in the direction, Lord, and to guide us in everything that we do, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, Lord, which are many, and that you hear us when we pray to you with one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven.